Hello. Well, there's a very fundamental question that we're all here in Memphis to answer. And that question is exactly what I want to go right to tonight. It's not a difficult one, but it's one that requires that we all act together as if our lives depended on it, because for many of our communities, they do. Put simply, the question is this. What does media reform mean to us? We know how elitist, unrepresentative, and corporate-driven our media is, and thank God this room needs no convincing of that. But the bigger, and to me, more critically important question is what are we going to do about it? What is the media system we want to build? I want to dream with you all. I want to take all the amazing diversity and creativity and funkiness that we all possess to loudly and proudly march forward with our mandate for a media system that's so appealing and inclusive and entertaining and engrossing and informative that Time Warner and Clear Channel won't stand a chance against us. What I'm proposing is a vision of the media that completely overhauls what we have here today. Not simply some rule changes here and some reform over there, hell no. What I'm energized by is the thoughtful and thorough thinking of those who are visioning and who believe in media justice. Because media justice is not interchangeable for media reform, and it's not another way of calling for media democracy. To me, media justice is about changing who is at the table at every single level. We want our communities represented and have power in content production, ownership, policy, and regulation. Disenfranchised communities don't just want to be invited in. We don't just want a mic put in our hands. We want to own the mic and we want to own the station. And we don't want to say in setting the rules, we want to call the game and play on our own court. Because it really doesn't matter if the Democrats control Congress or if Hillary or Barack are our next president. We can't put our trust in a system as it exists now. We need to be the voices of massive change. We need to be the voices of democratic and participatory media. We need nothing short of media justice. Let me give you a taste of what media justice could look like. And to do this, I want to go back into history to what I consider an incredible example of media based on social justice. Two months from now, there's going to be a momentous anniversary, not just for the American media, but for American democracy. 180 years ago, on March 16, 1827, before slavery was outlawed, the nation's first African-American newspaper was born in Brooklyn, New York. It was called Freedom's Journal, and it was a broadsheet newspaper, and it began with this powerful demand, quote, we wish to plead our own cause, too long have others spoken for us, end quote. So how did such a path-breaking black newspaper start, especially in the time when press ownership was exclusively and unapologetically the domain of wealthy white men? It has been posited by historians that the first African-American newspaper began in direct response to the naked racism of the white press. Yet, as veteran journalist Herb Boyd has told me, such a simplistic analysis denies the presence in the African-American community of existing powerful underground systems of communication, church newsletters, and the oral tradition of communicating. Freedom's Journal was so much more than a knee-jerk reaction to white racism. It was a community communi communicating amongst itself. In fact, it came on the coattails of generations of African-American leaders who risked life and limb to build community institutions and powerfully assert the need to plead their own cause and determine their own destiny. And here's the part to me that's relevant about how we can all be thinking about radically changing up the media system. See, if we simply followed a, a narrow model of media reform and managed to change some existing rules, it wouldn't be a victory because it must be pointed out that in the role that Freedom's Journal played as an abolitionist newspaper, it 
preceded William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator, which history has framed as the first abolitionist newspaper. Now, being good history students, you all know who William Lloyd Garrison is, right? Well, Garrison, an abolitionist, was a wealthy white man who published by trade. He started the newspaper, The Liberator, to speak to both black and white audiences about the need for slavery to be abolished. Garrison allowed Frederick Douglass to first be heard by a white audience by publishing him. Garrison wrote stinging editorials, and he pursued the cause of abolitionism relentlessly. To read history, Garrison was a hero, the white knight of the abolitionist movement. But wait, there's more. Now hanging out in the background is the quiet and powerful predecessor to the liberator, Freedom's Journal. And William Lloyd Garrison, by the time he decided that abolitionism needed a newspaper, well, Freedom's Journal had finished its three-year run. And as the history of our social justice movements tell us, rather than putting his funding behind or towards restarting Freedom's Journal or another African-American-run newspaper and truly stepping back and letting people most affected tell the story, he, as a wealthy white man, became the voice for abolitionism. It would be some years later that Frederick Douglass would come into his own, but the early 1830s of Samuel Cornish and John Russworm, well, they were totally forgotten as the well-resourced white newspapers took center stage with the cause of abolitionism. And I don't buy for a minute that it takes a white man to speak to a white man, that African Americans would not be heard by whites, hence the need for conscious whites to speak for disenfranchised people. Freedom's Journal proved that wrong in 1827, having a large white readership and its core black audience. And we have to ask today, what has changed? So, happy 180th to Freedom's Journal. And I hope we can take inspiration from you and march forward 180 years later. Which brings me to my conclusion. You see, the one major thing we need to do today is to hand the reins, the resources, and the power over to those who, like the founders of Freedom's Journal, have the incredible intellect and talent and lived experience who come to media work as community organizers to plead their own community's cause. In fact, right here in Memphis, there are people who we've been both training and learning from at the organization I work with, and I hope you get to meet them. Seek them out, because there are people like street vendors from New York City, like James Williams, the amazing James Williams, and he works as an organizer for the Street Vendor Project at the Urban Justice Center. And James being able to report puts him not only in a position to bring his fellow workers' voices out and increase their chance of winning their organizing goals, but it also helps other organized street vendors to understand, through James, the critical importance of their voices and input in the now largely white and elite conversations around media policy. Imagine for a second how incredible a community of currently very targeted and economically marginalized street vendors in New York City, almost all people of color, could benefit from a media system that allowed them to use hyper-local, publicly owned, municipal wireless to communicate with each other while they were working, alert one another to police harassment incidences, tell one another when a more prime vending spot was opening up. The sky's the limit. It could serve as an effective organizing tool, but right now, the discussions around municipal wireless do not include street vendors like James. We need to hand the reins over to those who have historically organized to win rights for all of us. I hope you also meet Abdullahi Barr. Abdullahi is one of the most amazing young journalists I've had the privilege of working with. He comes from Sierra Leone, and he spent a lot time locked up in prison on arriving in America simply for entering the country without proper documentation because he had to flee his own country for his life. Abdullahi comes to us through another partner organization, Nawion, which in Creole means, it belongs to us. What a great media justice uh, slogan that is. Now, Abdullahi and Nawion, we've been pushed to think about how we could change the media game so that immigrants who are currently locked up in the country's jails could benefit from participatory media Imagine if telecommunications policy meant that 
people in detention centres could have internet on a daily basis, not as a privilege, but as a right written into telecommunications policy. Well, that's the kind of media policy that we want to work for. And finally, also floating around here is, we're told, the youngest participant panelist here in Memphis, Ms. Hannah George, one of the sweetest and fiercest women I know. And Hannah's a media organizer with Radio Roots. And this past summer, Hannah as well as the Prison Moratorium Project, one of our partners, produced an incredible documentary on youth incarceration. Now, right after that report came, right after that documentary came out, there was a national report that backed up every finding of the voices in that documentary, yet there was not a single media outlet in the country that covered that national report and had a youth voice in there. Thank God for Hana and the Prison Moratorium Project. That is participatory media, that is media justice. So James, Abdullahi and Hannah, I sincerely hope that it's one of you up here in the next media reform conference enlightening and inspiring us towards what we can do to bring about a more just, ethical, democratic media. And I really hope you all hold me to my now publicly pledged ideal of what true media justice is, even if it means that one day very soon I don't have a morning show in New York to host because one of you all have taken over. Thank you.